Thank you very much. Good evening. And may I say how wonderful it is to be here on the first of my chat show series. Now, my guest tonight, I'm delighted to say, are author and screenwriter and old friend, who I've had the pleasure of working with many times, Wolf Mankiewicz, and someone who is here to prove that all those jokes about the bishop and the actress are quite untrue, the <laughs> Bishop of Salisbury, England. <laughs> Now, of course, we're going to be discussing religion tonight, but the first topic that we want to go into is, uh, in this day and age, do we still, or can we still, believe in God? And if not, why? Now, firstly, Wolf, if I may come to you, uh, you have described yourself as some sort of uh, armchair atheist. Now, I'd like to know, when you go up to bed, do you turn into a believer? No. Well, you don't. <laughs> no, no. Could you explain uh, that a little bit more? <laughs> but I, I believe that we should all live, try to live, as if uh, there were a God. But I personally have no conviction uh, in the matter. Um, I have no personal sense of the existence of a deity who is personally concerned about my personality, about my personal affairs, about my personal future or any aspect whatsoever of my existence. Uh -huh. So really, in other words, then you, you are exactly what you say you are. You are an atheist. You, don't, you, you believe in a God, and yet you don't, you don't believe in one. No, I, I don't have. You don't uh, have I don't a have God. a fixed, convinced you have uh, no belief. One that I have you... no personal awareness of it. No. I, I may say, on the other hand, that I feel that uh, it's a, I've always felt that the the possibility of the existence of a deity personally interested in us or otherwise was a very useless discussion. I don't mean that this particular discussion with no. you, Dawes, is Hardly. useless. Of course I've never not. had a useless discussion with you in my no, life. No, I wouldn't think so. I hope you're not going to say Oh, no, no, of course not. <laughs> but uh, I, what I mean is that uh, the, nature of, the nature of God, by definition or by indefinition, is such that he is not available to our inquisition. I mean, his nature is so beyond our conception that it becomes uh, absurd for us to speculate about it. And so, therefore, I describe myself as an armchair atheist in, uh, rather than a, a barricades atheist. I think it's a beautiful description. I loved it. An armchair atheist. I could see you sitting there pontificating about the fact there's no God. And then when your last hour came in bed, I was wondering what you were going to do. No, no, but my last... <laughs> ah, it's a, it's a, a, a relevant consideration. I mean, Casanova... Uh, whose life I've just been working on, because I've just written a play about him, uh, was uh, very much exercised over this, uh, this question. How will one react at the end? And, of course, it is a very legitimate question to ask any atheist. Uh, and he, for his part, couldn't see that uh, the, the factor of imminent death could make very much difference to a lifetime's uh, reasoning uh, on this totally... Uh, Irrational yes, subject. Quite. I myself have actually been very near death, and uh, in the past year, and I had no awareness whatsoever. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to actually get back to that in a second. I personally think that you are very brave to say and think that you are an atheist, or and think like an atheist, because I always feel, and I'm going to ask you, Bishop, a, a, a question now, that uh, I, like many other people. Uh, possibly turn to religion, and do you think this is true, that many people turn to religion uh, rather than having a love of God, it's a fear of God, as a sort of feeling of insurance that there must be something afterwards, that all this life that we <coughs> lead is not in vain. Uh, in other words, uh, what I'm trying to say is that even if we have doubts about God, at the same time there is this terrifying feeling, oh, it's not all going to end surely when I die, and, and suddenly, we, we become religious as, as a fear or an insurance, well, if you like. I, I mean, because I'm dressed like this, you see, everybody assumes that I was born <coughs> with a dog collar on, which I wear in the bath, and I never had any doubts, <laughs> or doubts whatever. This is totally untrue. Uh, I mean, let me say, first of all, that the, the atheist, who's really a thinking atheist, uh, I admire because he's absolutely loyal to his convictions. 
uh, a great many people, not of course in Southampton or the Southern Television, but you've probably met them elsewhere, when their knees are knocking together, yes. they start to <coughs> fall on them. Yes. And, and write to somebody and say, could we have a national day of prayer because we're not winning this war or Ireland's not going right. That I rather secretly despise, although there may be, uh, uh, a man may be brought <coughs> face to face with God by his death. But uh, I think that many of us, certainly I'm one, who didn't find God, but as we were saying just now, the hound of heaven pursued you down the ages. I, I was brought up with God on a plate. He was part of the background, the struts of religion. Then I suddenly woke up. Actually, that's rather a strange phrase, because it's exactly what I did do. I slept, walked over, I suppose, half a mile. I should never do that again in my life, I imagine, into a friend's room, who was the first really sincere agnostic I'd ever met. And he, I suppose, was, in my view, was sent by God to shake me out of the fact of just running along the rails, going to be ordained and so on. And I went totally away from religion, wouldn't have nothing at all to do with it. And as I see it, I see God in my newspaper, I see him in the theatre, I see him in the novel, I see him in my wife's eyes, I see him in his creation, <laughs> I see him in music, and he has pursued me down the ages. So it's not a question of whether I look after God, it's a question of God looking after That's me. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Uh, in, in my own small way, I became a, a, a Catholic convert uh, some years ago, uh, and this was exactly the same thing that happened to me. I had never been religious. In fact, religion had always rather bored me. Uh, it wasn't sort of shoved down my throat as a child, but uh, I'd had an awful lot of bad experiences with people like the Women's Catholic Guild of America in Hollywood when I first went there who I found to be a very hypocritical bunch of people, and particularly Catholics, I'd always thought in my ignorance that they were people who went and confessed all their sins on Sunday and went straight out and did them all again for the rest of the week. Um, well, because of uh, <laughs> that's usually said by people who never had the guts to make their confession. Exactly. Never mind, let's exactly. go. Yes. And I suddenly went to church. I mean, I won't go into the story of how I actually went to church. It was something to do with my little my youngest son's nanny, who was a Catholic, who I had always made fun of and said, oh, you Catholics, you know, you're all hypocrites and so on. Uh, and I, she, she said to me one day, well, why don't you come into church with me one, one Sunday and just see, it's beautiful in there, they play guitars and it... And I, I didn't really want to go. Uh, in my supreme conceit, I thought that if I walked into church, everybody would be looking at me because I was Diana Dawes. This is how egotistical I was at the time. And of course nobody did because nobody was interested in me. They were only interested in God. That was the reason that they were there. And I sat there and I had this extraordinary feeling of peace and tranquility. And it was interesting to hear you say that you had suddenly woken up one day because that's exactly how I felt. I felt like a, a sleepwalker who had been stumbling and blind all my life and then suddenly one day this marvelous feeling, this beautiful feeling, rather like being touched on the cheek by a butterfly's wing. But can I ask you, when, came when, when you came out of church? I mean, Wolf is you, sniggering we, already. I knew he would, of no, course. No, 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 I love it. I, lo <laughs> no, I love it. I'm quite <laughs> prepared to be mocked by Wolf. I have been since <laughs> no, 1954. No, 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 1954. I want to be absolutely clear, particularly for his uh, benefit, that I mean, OK, in church, yes, but what effect did it have in your ordinary life, I mean, with your extraordinary life that you lead compared with mine? Well, it, it was... It was a very peaceful uh, uh, feeling, which it was almost like something occurring. I mean, my life has always been very turbulent, very turbulent. Uh, all sorts of things have happened. And suddenly, it wasn't so much a feeling of what it had on my life, but it was just this wonderful inner tranquility. And it was as though I had been touched by something very beautiful. Almost uh, one hears the stories of people saying, oh, I have seen the light. It, it wasn't as dramatic as that, but it was very gentle. It was very simple. And this is why, Wolf, I wanted to say to you about your illness, because uh, this happened to me in May 1974, that I was actually converted to Catholicism. I had to really study to get in. I mean, they didn't want me. I'd been married three times, and I wasn't actually a, the best candidate for the Catholic Church. But um, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't easy. It took a year 
year, and yeah, I had conversion. to really... Uh, no conversion, con conversion lives on yeah. such uh, activities. Yeah, yeah. 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 No but anyway, yeah. they finally agreed to let me in. Uh, and uh, that was in May 1974. And in November of 1974, I was struck down with meningitis, which I nearly died. I mean, it's a miracle that I'm here today. But most people, particularly press, and we all know what the press are like, uh, has said that, oh, it, obviously that she became a Catholic because she was nearly uh, struck down with this meningitis and she nearly died, and therefore she's now paying a great tribute of thanks to God and she's become a Catholic. It wasn't so at all. Uh, and when I'm asked why I became a Catholic, but there was no dramatic reason. There were no great trumpets and drums. It was very gentle and it was very simple. And I think that is the essence of... Of religion. Uh, could I ask you a question? Uh, you say a, a convert. I mean, uh, is this impertinent? So, were you converted from anything to, to yes, something? Yes. Well, I was born Church of England. Oh, but you were a non-playing member. A non-playing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Not only that, I wasn't even a fully paid-up member. No, no. <laughs> what we call a country member. A country yes, member. Yes, yes. I mean, that's why you use the word convert. I mean, you had to go from something to something. But am I allowed through you, Madam Chairperson, yes. uh, to talk oh, to I him? I like being called that. Uh, no, I was going to talk to him. May I talk to him first? Because uh, yes, I'm dying indeed. to say yes, We can talk on. Yes, we've, yes, we've, yes, got, yes. we've got yes, on to yes. this illness thing, you see. Now, I know, Wolf, that you were extremely ill uh, last year, in fact. Now, did this in any way make you feel that you wanted to turn towards religion or, or renounce this atheist Not at all. feeling that you had? Uh, when I was um, uh, bleeding to death in these particular circumstances, um, I had, first of all, a feeling of great peace because when your blood is running out, you, you do feel very peaceful. Uh, <laughs> Rather sleepy, I should think. Well, you start to get sleepy, but your awareness of what's going on is, uh, is very clear, at least my awareness was. I also had that experience that they write an awful lot about at the moment of being at a high distance away from oneself and seeing oneself quietly bleeding to death with people running around trying to pump blood into you and that kind of thing. I had that experience. I had no experience of long corridors with uh, illuminous figures at the end of them, but perhaps I didn't lose enough blood. I mean, they only ran <laughs> 22 pints into me. Um, but I was intensely aware of my will to survive these circumstances. And I felt very strongly, I mean totally, uh, concentrated upon surviving them if I possibly could. And uh, as I came through this experience and had the necessary uh, long, tedious operations and so on, and came out of the other end, as it were, and still had to go through all the things that one has to go through, the re-education that one has yeah. after large-scale surgery, um, I, every day, as it were, set myself very, very concrete tasks of moving uh, to a certain extent and uh, getting this, uh, you know, the sort of things that one does when one is immobile and one wants to become mobile. And my will was applied constantly to nothing else with total ruthlessness. But no God. No what? No God. The God didn't come into no, it at all. No, no God. No, I was deeply grateful and deeply thankful and very, very moved, I must tell you, by the extraordinary uh, activity, the labour-intensive activity of these people, these many people who didn't know me, into whose life I just floated as a potential corpse, who applied themselves with such incredible uh, intensity to saving my life. I found that immensely moving. And my feeling about men, about human beings, was uh, not changed, but um, supported by this experience. So th for me, the experience was not a negative experience in, in any way at all. Um, but it didn't bring you any closer to No, it, any it gave me religion. some good ideas for stories. <laughs> well, it would. You're a writer. And, and as I started to surface, I mean, after these first operations, I immediately started to think of stories. But I, I, had, I have a friend, uh, well, Brian Forbes, who is a writer, like yourself, he is also an atheist, uh, and he and another friend of mine, an oh. actor called Lionel Jeffries, who is a Catholic convert like myself, <coughs> were coming back from America in a plane, and apparently there was uh, some engine trouble, and it was all very, very bad for a few minutes, and the pilot, or whoever it was, came up and made a speech and said, look, you know, fasten your safety belts and hurry, you know, whatever, because we don't know if we're going to make it. And Lionel Jeffries leaned forward to Brian Forbes, who was in the seat of, in front of him, and said, well, I'm crossing myself, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to 
it very quickly, Wolf. Um, uh, what would you, I mean, what would you feel safer? Please, God, you never are in a crashing plane. But if you were in a crashing plane, would that, would, would the fear of, of, of that sort of suddenly turn you towards saying, oh, please, God, save me, which is what I'm sure we've all done when we've been in an aeroplane? I don't think so. Uh, I don't know, of course, because I've never been in a crashing aeroplane. Oh, and in such circumstances, as, as I was saying before, Casanova observed that in yeah. extraordinary circumstances, yeah. one behaves in an extraordinary and irrational way. I mean, as when he was in prison and he needed some tinder to make a lamp and suddenly remembered that he'd got his, his uh, tailor to put tinder in the armpits of his new coat. And then he prayed, that the, uh, he prayed fervently to God that the, that the, the tailor didn't, hadn't forgotten and then when he found that there was tinder in the coat so he could make this, this little lamp, he prayed fervently again and then he stopped praying and said, what kind of a God is it who can be bothered with the question of influencing my tailor to put tinder in the armpit of my coat in case I get incarcerated in a prison in Venice? <laughs> Can I ask... Uh, yeah, I was I, going to ask you, Ben, yeah. it's your, your turn now, I, but no, do you think I, I you would, could convert Wolf? I, 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 you you use the word convert. I was wondering what they start ah. from, whether it's a non-start or a country member. But, but uh, <laughs> could, uh, 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 could I ask him on my port side, uh, if, if somebody asked him, uh, Wolf, uh, what do you think happens to you when you physically die? Uh, could I ask you what I call a Robin that. Day question, <laughs> i.e. in not more than half an hour, you know, when he did, what about the... Uh, I mean, it's a ridiculous question to ask you quickly, but what would you say to somebody? What will you, do you think will happen to you on death? You mean bef just before I die? No, no, when, when, you, when you... I mean, is on the 14th of January 2004, that's the end of Wolf. Ah. Oh. oh, yes. You mean, yes. is it terminal? Yes. For my personal, of course. Yes. Uh, but uh, I think that I have some kind of uh, uh, limited extension in my copyrights, yes, for example, yes, which will yes. last until 50, 50 yes. years. I knew, 50 I knew years. you'd say that. Yeah, yes. and, all, <laughs> and yes. also my, my children and their children, ah, so far ah, as I have some yes, influence, yes. eventually it yes. will filter down. And anyway, what I am communicating is only a fractured and tattered remnant of the traditional wisdom that I have inherited from my fathers and largely of a basically of a Jewish nature uh, and this communication will go on and I'm part of that tradition of communication that piece of that small piece of human wisdom yeah. which goes on I believe uh, as long as there are human beings uh, but me personally no I think it's terminal yep yeah, well it's, it's interesting because we you're Jewish I was Church of England, I'm now Catholic, and we have the bishop who is Church of England. The basis I want to for ask a good you, joke. It's marvellous, yes, it does. It sounds like the Scotsman, the Irishman, and the English. I, I, want, I want to put in something, because there's, if I allow me to say so without impertinence, there's little tiny cracks between a Roman Catholic Christian and an Anglican Christian or a Baptist Christian. Between all the Christians, there are very tiny cracks, compared with the vast chasm between all Christians and those who do not acknowledge the name of Christ. Uh, you make it sound as an enormous crack, you see. I wanted to protest against that before you went oh, on. Why should? You're a Protestant. And a ecumenical. And a I was, of course, I was going to ask you, Bishop, uh, and that is that, I mean, I was Church of England, as you say, a, a fully unpaid-up member, and uh, uh, does it disturb you that uh, the Church of England, that you are representing the Church of England, which was or is founded on the lust and the demands of Henry VIII's oh, Diana. desire to marry Anne Boleyn. <laughs> I, I, I'm I, sorry I, about that. I, that was a bit of a whopper. No, I shouldn't no, 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 not at all. We're, we're I'm trying so, to make an interesting I, show. I, I, I mean, I, I, that's what it's all about. I, th I thought they'd all faint with surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought they'd have gone out like the church commissioners and brothels at Paddington. <laughs> I mean, no intelligent Roman Catholic. You talk to Cardinal Hume. If he heard you'd say that, I think he'd... Would he Wait. excommunicate? No, 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 I think he'd, he'd go off to Rome for rest. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, that, that is totally untrue. I mean, don't let's have a squabble about Henry no, VIII. No, I would never squabble the, with you. The, the, uh, you'd be amazed. Um, <laughs> I, I think the, the, the thing is that does God want you to serve him uh, in the best possible way you can in every single day and moment uh, in this way? Or that way. If God said to me, I think you would be, serve me best it, as a Baptist, uh, a Baptist I would be tomorrow. Uh, until he does say that, uh, 
uh, it's no good longing for a, a flat in Mayfair, there are lots of hungry sheep at Wimbledon. <laughs> um, how attractive it might be. Uh, your particular part of the church, which I admire enormously, and my many friends are in, and has things which I envy enormously, some things which I've paid I do not admire. But uh, I think the important thing is to stress is the unity, not the disunity. And that's why I'm not <coughs> going to, for one moment, be led on to Henry VIII. <laughs> well, I'm glad I was never led on to Henry VIII. I'm sure I would have been if I'd been around in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, it's I, interesting. I think, I think that's past Nem Con. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, though, because I, I often feel it's because uh, so many religions, they're split up into what are rather like clubs. You know, you say, well, I'm a... Protestant, I'm a Methodist, I'm a John the Baptist, and really, as you said, it, basically, God wants us to, stir, to serve him, and, and uh, all these different religions and names and things really are unimportant. I mean, being a Christian is not, it's not an easy thing, and being a Catholic is not an easy thing to be. And Bear, if I may say so, just interject, although it's not my affair, as it were, uh, <laughs> being a... Uh, uh, Peaceful Christians seems to be awfully difficult for all of you Christians. Yeah. How, how right you are. Uh, the thing that annoys me, and well, angers me, it does more than annoy me, is the, is the fact that all the trouble in Ireland and all these things that are done, uh, whereby they say that uh, religion is at, the, is at the base of it. I mean, they say the Catholics are fighting the Protestants. It's got nothing to do with religion at all, any of it. It's all politics and fanatics, and, and this really angers me. Well, religion me. certainly stimulates the conflict, let's say. Well, it does, yes. But uh, on the other hand, you see, I get very upset. You know, people who are not religious often say to me, oh, if you believe in God, if, if what about your God? What about the, 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 the horror of Abavan? Where was your God when, when all these poor people were, were killed? And, and they always blame God for everything that happened. But they, they, people are so quick to, believe, but all, to blame God. With all God. due respect, I mean, yeah. don't they do that? Because you are promoting a very uh, questionable, in my opinion, right from a rational point of view, a very questionable uh, belief that God is personally concerned with every a human being and every sparrow, and in spite of the overpopulation of both sparrows and human beings, <laughs> his uh, uh, care is extensible to an infinite degree, and therefore all these human beings say, yes, okay, we accept that, and therefore God must take the responsibility or must explain to us, or you I must explain to us I think the bishop would be way. better equipped well, to answer that yeah, than me. No, I, I think you're right on The fault is, is, if I may say so, it's the fault of the religions that, uh, that preach that God is so personally involved in every living organism. It's demonstrable that there is no such involvement. Well, I, I always thought that he was. I mean, I, you know, it, it, just, well, okay, it just upsets the, me that people are so ready to believe Dawes, that God is, is responsible. Possible, is it not possible, Dawes, Bishop, I just put it to you, I mean, you know, you have a feeling, you have a revelation about these things, I don't. Is it not possible that God's design may involve a very large-scale distribution of seed that is to say, you scatter an awful lot of seed and an awful lot of it has to die in order for a very small amount of it to mature. Maybe that's part of God's pattern too. If God is so beyond, is so suprahuman, then uh, his concepts are suprahuman too. Well, of course, that takes us to the, 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 the uh, other conception, was God an astronaut? I don't know if you remember reading all about oh, that, yes. but there are so many indications in the Bible that this, there is a possibility this could be true, the burning bush, the fiery chariots, the star of Bethlehem. <laughs> but, but, but this is a long way from this is a long way. <laughs> Do you think that's what? better than Henry VIII? Uh, or? Uh, no, <laughs> but I, I think this, this is... is I've got a lovely one for you coming up, Bishop, uh, but this I'm is, not going to go down uh, this is... Uh, I was at a college founded by Henry VIII. Were um, you? Uh, uh, a place called Trinity College, Cambridge. Oh. You wouldn't have heard of it. Um, uh, but, but he makes one point, and that is that any Christian who tries to pretend that you can be a Christian without suffering hasn't come to terms with a central fact of Christianity, namely the cross. Therefore, any person who tries to explain away suffering has an easy answer for it, and there are certain sects, as you know, has a very easy answer that there's no such thing as suffering, uh, in my view, is balking the real fundamental question. There is no answer in this life, Christians believe, to the problem of suffering. We have, I'm sorry, Bishop, I don't want to hear <coughs> it. I hate to stop anybody in full flight. I hate to stop talking. We've got 
30 seconds or something ridiculous left. I haven't even had time to ask anybody what they think and whether they would like to ask any questions, and that's the fault of Southern TV, not mine. We're going to go on talking here, and I'm sure it's going to get much more interesting, especially when I get to the subject of gay vicars, which is what I wanted to do. <laughs> but anyway, what about thank gay you for atheists? joining us. Gay atheists! Well, we could get onto that too, but anyway, thank you all for coming along here, and I hope we see you again next week.